Good evening, Bahamas, and thank you for joining us for the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration's Report to the Nation. My name is Janice Miller, and I'm the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry. I will serve as your moderator for today's report. Our ministry is headed by the Honorable Ellsworth Johnson, who will now present an update on the work we have been doing and our plans for the future. Welcome, Minister Johnson. Please unmute my minister. I do apologize. Good afternoon, Bahamas. I would like to begin by thanking the Most Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Hubert Minnis, for this opportunity to speak directly to the people and commend him and my cabinet colleagues for their commitment to transparency and accountability in governance. Yet again, we are setting a precedent that I hope will serve as an example for future administrations. It is a privilege and honor to stand before the people of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas today to give an account of my stewardship of the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry, and Immigration, and the progress we have been making with our future-focused agenda. My team has prepared an introductory message to give you an insight into who we are and what we do. At the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration, our mission is to lead the way on policies related to movement of financial resources, goods and people. We cultivate growth within the financial services sector, serving as a stabilizing force during this time of economic uncertainty. We will expand opportunities for Bahamians to participate in international trade. And we will continue to protect our borders and facilitate legal movement of people for the benefit of all Bahamian people. Developments are underway across all departments to pave the way for new industries and new services. We are in a time of unprecedented change and the Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration is evolving with the times. Our agenda includes the modernization of departmental rules and policies. The introduction of COVID-19 safety policies for workspaces and public facilities. The digital transformation of operational resources and components. The development of new sector and sub-sector opportunities. And capacity building exercises to upskill existing staff and recruit new talent to fill skill gaps. Through strategic innovations, we are creating a foundation for long-term development. We are bringing about a transformation that will spur growth for the next five years, 10 years, and beyond. I would like to thank my dynamic leadership team for all of their efforts. It is through their hard work and innovation that we are able to achieve our goals. Seven months have passed since COVID-19 pandemic first arrived at our shores. Since then, the government of the Bahamas has taken well-measured steps to care for our people, bolster the economy, and manage our nation's finances. The ministry has a crucial role to play in ensuring that these goals are met, regardless of the challenges we face. It is our duty to fulfill our mandate and ensure that we are making progress on our key objectives. We will continue to push forward with our, with our agenda of national advance, advancement through innovation. In this report, 
we will provide you with a department by department overview of all the major initiatives launched by, by my ministry and the expected impact of each initiative beginning with financial services. The financial services sector continues to be a key component of their economic engine powering the Bahamas' position as a global leader in financial services. As the nation's second largest industry behind tourism, financial services represents a significant pillar of our economy. Throughout the years, our financial services industry has proven resilient, having survived numerous challenges such as blacklists and gray lists. Building on our past success, the financial services unit must adapt to the challenges of COVID-19. On July 20th of this year, the Central Bank of the Bahamas released results from a survey of internationally active banks and trusts. The results from the survey are reassuring. All institutions have been able to maintain effective operations in the new environment and financial impact have been minimal. This is excellent news for international financial services and we are pleased that operations have continued in a resilient manner. Indeed, this month, we learned that the Bahamas improved its ranking in the Global Financial Services Index by 36 places, securing the place of second in the Caribbean and Latin America. We are proud to see such a significant improvement and we expect more progress as we continue to invest in the future of our financial services sector. Effective policy, effective policy implementation requires the expertise of a balanced team working together like a well-oiled machine to get the job done. This is what we are building within the renewed financial services unit. After five years of challenges with executive leadership, we have hired a new team, inclusive of a new director and the first ever deputy director of financial services. We have also prioritized the hiring of additional financial services officers. To ensure that all team members are aware of the latest trends and best practices, we have secured commitments from major financial services partners to provide training for all of our officers free of charge. Ultimately, to ensure that the Bahamas remains competitive within the global financial services landscape, our ministry is fully committed to investing in the recruitment and cultivation of talent. COVID-19 has not prevented our team from continuing its work to promote the Bahamas' financial services in industry as, and engage with our local and international stakeholders. On May 20th, the ministry held its first ever virtual symposium to rave reviews. This was a collaborative effort involving ourselves the Ministry of Finance, the Office of the Attorney General, the Office of the Prime Minister, and the Securities Commission of the Bahamas. The attendance and response from industry stakeholders, both local and abroad, was overwhelmingly positive. We are now planning a virtual trade symposium that is expected to mirror this success. Not only has the symposium allowed us to effectively address engagement issues during the pandemic, it also fits into our overall digital transformational digital transformation model, and we continue to be to be utilized moving forward. In the near future, we will have the opportunity to host another financial services symposium in conjunction with the Economic Recovery Committee. During the pandemic, we have worked collaboratively with the Bahamas Financial Services board to promote the Bahamas as one of the world's top financial services center. We are determined to see the financial service industry bounce back stronger than ever and let the world know why the Bahamas should be the clear choice for financial services. I would like to thank the CEO and executive director of the Bahamas Financial Services Board, Ms. Tanya McCartney, for her leadership in steering the course during this time and would also like to congratulate her as this year's winner of the prestigious Woman of the Year Award by International Investment in the UK. BFSB 
has also been shortlisted for the best IFC award by World Briefings 2020 Europe Award under her, under her watch. With the support of the Ministry of Financial Services, the Bahamas Financial Services Board has partnered with local and international agencies to host a number of virtual events and facilitate international publications, which includes the BFSB's annual Gateway Magazine, the release of the International Investment 2020 Special Bahamas Report, the hosting of the Opaleski Roundtable, a private invitation only meeting facilitated by leading voices in the financial services industry, the highlighting of opportunities and trends for Bahamas captives in the captive insurance times, and a feature in the International Investor Magazine. With our partners at BFSB, we are leveraging all avenues to highlight that the Bahamas is still the best choice, even during these uncertain times. Another critical element in our digital transformation is the launch of the ministry's first ever website. You can visit us at mofstii.gov.bs, where you will have access to the latest news and updates straight from the ministry. Prior administrations have explored this idea, but under the leadership of this administration, we were able to get it done during the pandemic. By the end of 2020, the ministry will launch the tax residency certificate. This certificate will enable expatriate residents and investors to prove that they are resident in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Through this certificate, we will provide access to financial accounts and income records according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Common Reporting Standards. The end result will be the elimination of opportunities for those who seek to use our financial services system for tax evasion and, and, avoidance, and avoidance purposes. We are in the consulting phase of the tax residency certificate implementation and working to draw together the differing views of key stakeholders, key stakeholders. This will ensure that the final version of the tax residency certificate legislation is the best version possible. Our efforts have been universally hailed by local and international observers alike. As of yesterday, we tabled in parliament a number of amendments to existing statutes as a part of our agenda to modernize the sector and bring it into compliance with international standards. The financial services industry has been keen to see these amendments made law for quite some time. These include amendments to the Companies Act, the International Business Companies Act, the Rule Against Perpetuities Abolition Act, amendments to the Property Execution of Deeds and Documents Act, and the Foundations Act. The ministry is creating a 21st century legislative framework for the long-term stabilization and growth of the financial services sector. The end result will be positive growth for the nation's second largest industry. Our goal is to keep the sector in good standing and promote the Bahamas as a user-friendly international financial service center. We have been working to advance trade as the third pillar of our economy. Expanding trade in the Bahamas will mean greater economic stability and diversification, both of which are in high demand as we grapple with the global pandemic. In 2018, the value of the Bahamas exports totaled over $500 million, and there is still much room for growth. The trade and industry unit is currently undergoing several changes as it is revamped to be more efficient and effective in carrying out its mandate. Despite the difficulties posed by COVID-19, we continue to push forward with our subject, with our sub substantive agenda. We are in the process of retooling our team by filling our leadership needs. The most significant hire this, in this process has been the appointment of a director of trade who will be supported 
by an expanded trade off by expanded team of trade officers. The unit is engaged in, in an ongoing initiative to improve the ease of doing business across all sectors. In keeping with this objective, my ministry is improving access to applicants under the Industries Encouragement Act and improving the speed of processing requests. The Industries Encouragement Act provides duty-free concessions for the importation of machinery, raw material, and building supplies for locally based manufacturers, as well as exemptions for real property tax. Local manufacturers will enjoy a faster process that gives quicker access to related tax relief and concessions. The new registrants under the Industries Encouragement Act can apply and pay online for concessions via the Industries Encouragement Act page on the ministry's website. Because we have given special attention to improving the Industries Encouragement Act's application process, the ministry has granted close to $230,000 in concessions since July of this year. Melissa Darrell, whose company Shiva makes sorbets and ice creams, recently registered under the Industries Encouragement Act. Here's what she had to say about the experience with the process. So what we do is we make sorbet using the local fruits and flavors, and we distribute to um, local stores, convenience stores, gas stations, we even do walk-up sales. The Industries Encouragement Act, we actually found out about that process while we were doing our business plan and planning. They asked us about our product and they were analyzed and then they told us how they would be able to help us. It may have been a few weeks to maybe a few months to get the, everything done, but we were always in contact with the people at the office. We were assigned um, a case person to um, when we apply for a manufacturing exemption, and that uh, person was able to communicate with us and give us all the help and answer all the questions that we needed. These concessions are a lifeline for us because in actuality, you have a lot of expenses that come into, come into play when you own a business. You write your list and you say, these are the things that we project that we may be important for the entire year. Now, not everything on that list will be approved. Uh, I think every local manufacturer should apply for this because when it comes to the dollar value, you're making money, but half of that is going back into something that you don't actually have to pay. So those funds could actually be going into your revenue. If you have the opportunity and if you care enough, do the paperwork and do the legwork and get the concession because it's there for us. That's why it was put in place. It's there so that businesses can have an opportunity and so that we can start to propel our economy. As seen with Ms. Darville, the Industries Encouragement Act can be a useful in incentive to help local manufacturers to lower costs on their way to success. We hope that all eligible companies will take advantage of the available concessions. We are collaborating with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Office of the Attorney General, Customs Department, Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources, Standards Bureau, and other agencies to look at existing trades agreements and new opportunities to increase trade in goods and services. The unit is currently working along with the Office of the Attorney General and the Law Reform Commission to review existing intellectual property and competition policies. Of course, on the horizon, we have the nation's eventual accession to the World Trade Organization, which will bring even more trade opportunities for local business and business owners. Trade and industry related policy will play a, a, a significant role in our economic recovery. We are living in the era of globalization and service to customers abroad. My ministry has overseen the development of a three step plan to move the economy forward through strengthening the national approach to trade. The first step is to increase awareness and provide access to information on trade agreements. Those considering investing in manufacturing sector 
should be armed with the knowledge of all the trade deals that they can take advantage of to tap into international markets. This includes, and, not, and is not limited to, the existing trade deals with the United States, Canada, the European Union, including the ACPEU agreement specific to African, Caribbean, and, and Pacific group of states, as well as the upcoming economic partnership agreement with the UK as it prepares to leave the EU. In fact, we are hosting a high level symposium on the UK CARIFORM Economic Partnership Agreement this coming Friday. The second step is the provision of sector specific information to business supporting organizations. This involves the development of reports to give insight into general provisions of the trade agreements and how interested parties can gain access and, equip, and, equip, and equipping organizations like the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce, the Small Business Development Center, and the Bahamas Agricultural and Industrial Corporation with all the information needed to engage their members. The third step involves facilitating links between the Industry, Industries Encouragement Act and micro, small, and medium enterprises within the green, blue, and orange economies. This will ensure that our manufacturers are taking advantage of all opportunities for reduced duties on raw materials and other imports, lowering the cost on operations for many local manufacturers. These steps are in response to the need of the business community that we serve. My ministry, along with the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce, surveyed 100 businesses to determine the best way to engage them as we move to ratify the UK Bahamas Economic Partnership Agreement. 70% of the respondents were interested in exporting goods to the UK, but the main obstacles reported were finding information on market opportunities and import requirements, connecting with buyers and logistical issues. Step one and two of our three-step plan addresses these information gaps and will, be and, and will better prepare Bahamian businesses to compete in the global market. The end result of these initiatives is a more robust and resilient economy with more ownership opportunities for everyone and more business tapping into the international market for Bahamian made products. The Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration is also responsible for international arbitration and other alternate dispute resolution processes, such as mediation and construction adjudication. As a part of this responsibility, the ministry is charged with developing relevant laws and promoting alternate dispute resolution. Alternate dispute resolution is a method of, re of resolving re disputes without, report, uh, without resorting to the courts. ADR has been gaining significant traction over the past decades and has been linked with generally favorable outcomes in other jurisdictions. In fact, a survey conducted by Queen Mary, University of London, indicated that 97% of survey respondents preferred international arbitration as their preferred method of dispute resolution. And, and an overwhelming 99% of respondents would recommend international arbitration to resolve cross-border disputes. The landscape for dispute resolution has changed and the Bahamas must keep pace. The goal is to establish the Bahamas as a center for international commercial arbitration and ADR in general. This will result in the Bahamas becoming more attractive to international investors, improvements in the Bahamas' position as a leading international financial center, and the development of a new industry that would positively affect trade and commercial activities. We will aggressively promote local ADR services on the global stage. And while the economic impact of these initiatives may, be, may not be felt overnight, we are committed to building this sector for the long-term growth. 
ADR will expand ac access to equitable remedies for many Bahamians and companies involved in disputes while maintaining strong business relationships as ADR processes are typically faster, less adversarial, and cheaper than traditional court proceedings. I'm delighted to announce that the ministry has hired an arbitration consultant for the sole purpose of overseeing the rollout of ADR. This pioneering initiative is one of the ministry's highest priorities. I turn now to immigration. Immigration remains one of the high profile issues in the national discussion. While COVID-19 has impacted operations in many unforeseen ways, we have put great effort into upholding the law, thereby protecting the fundamental dignity of the human person and protecting our borders. The ministry has made it a top priority to continue regular repatriations exercises to ensure that our facilities are not overrun by, in, by the influx of migrants entering the country illegally. As our officers are on the front lines of holding our laws, we must ensure that we empower them to do their jobs effectively while keeping them as safe as possible. This is why the Department of Immigration was one of the first agencies in the, in the country to introduce temperature checking and tracking upon entry into the facility. The department has also delivered on its goal for full implementation of a cashless transaction system. The immigration integrated management system is equipped to interface with the treasury and provide access to cashless payment methods for all services. The benefit of this system includes improved efficiency, resulting in a shorter wait time and reduced opportunity, opportunities for corruption due to transactions being traceable, leaving no room for secret deals or theft. This is a part of our zero tolerance policy for corruption. The cashless platform was soft launch for public testing at the beginning of this month and became fully operational this week. Services are also being digitized. Services are also being digitized as ex existing application forms will be made available online to facilitate the replacement of in-person processes and online processes. Customers applying for any service will be able to do so from the comfort of their own home. Applications for work permit renewals are among the first of these services that will be rolled out within the next six months. Any in-person activity will be made by appointments only. Appointments will be booked through the online portal and any VIP services necessary will also be done by appointment. In-person activities will be limited as the department is also actively exploring methods for efficient delivery of documents to customers. These efforts are a part of our digital transformation to modernize the immigration department and provide 21st century convenience to our customers. Of course, the, the adoption of digital processes has been expedited by the need to create systems and policies to limit, to limit possible exposure to COVID-19. We have heard the cry for better customer service and efficiency, especially as it relates to programs that have been designed to use immigration as an instrument for investment and economic growth. To answer this cry, we have restructured our monarch house operations and put in place new leadership to manage processing and customer relations. The deputy director of financial services is leading this transformation. And given a strong legal background and connection to industry, we see a unique opportunity to improve the way these processes work. We are moving full speed ahead in digitizing this area. Gone are the days when applicants would have to travel, to travel back and forth between offices. With this latest initiative, all services will be provided from one central location. Monarch House will now be a one-stop shop for permanent residency and citizenship, where applicants can enroll, pay and collect their documents without undue hassle. We anticipate that Monarch House 
will be fully operational as a one-stop shop by early November. <clears throat> we have also launched an internal secret shopper program where secret shoppers use department services and report on the quality of service received, the integrity of the process and adherence to protocols and laws. This initi initiative is coupled with the revitalization of our complaints and corruptions unit in support of our objective of maintaining the highest standards of excellence in service and ethics. The government continues to explore and review the, specific not the, the specifics of the nationality, immigration and asylum bill that will address long-standing issues of statelessness and citizenship for those born to non-Bahamian parents and provide a fair process for people to apply for citizenship with a clear cutoff date for those who do not prioritize applying for citizenship. We are creating legislation that will protect the sovereignty of the Bahamas while also ensuring that we protect fundamental human rights. One of the marquee immigration related initiatives that is fast track for launch is the previously announced extended stay permit program. In fact, the program was launched, will be launched next week. This program will allow international students and workers to reside in the Bahamas for 12 months. Successful applicants will study and work remotely while enjoying the pleasures of the Bahamian experience. The government has prioritized the extended stay permit program as a revenue generating activity recommended by the Economic Recovery Committee. The Department of Immigration will continue to work collaboratively with other government agencies to bring another first ever initiative into fruition as the Bahamas enters the market as a global innovator in the remote work economy. Other revenue generating activities being explored include the offering of rough rush services <clears throat> for a fee at Monarch House, as well as the charging of fees for visitors seeking to extend their stay in the Bahamas. The Department of Immigration is fully aligned with the ministry's fo future focused agenda, creating a foundation for short term recovery and long term growth. The national advancement through innovation. This is the core of our approach to overcoming the challenge, the challenges of the COVID-19 crisis and coming out of this pandemic more resilient than ever. There will be many first ever achievements as we adapt to the new normal and we have built a team capable of leading us to these lofty goals. The Ministry of Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration is ready to take advantage of the opportunities before us and drive growth in new and unexplored ways. Our ultimate objective is to make a positive impact on the country through our contributions to the economic and social well being of the Bahamian people. I thank you. Thank you, Minister Johnson. We will now take questions from our media partners. Each reporter can pose two questions. For technical questions, we have the full slate of the ministry's technical leadership here, including the Director of Immigration, Director of Trade, Director of Financial Services. <clears throat> Our first question is from Ms. Kishilo Adley of ZNS. Oh, Our first question is from Ms. Kishilo Adley of ZNS. Thank you. Our first question is from Ms. Kishilo Adley. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I heard the minister uh, mention the WTO. That's something we haven't heard in a long time. And I know that's a process that dates back as far as uh, 2001, the process of accession. I'm just wondering wh where things stand with that now. And um, has time uh, of world conditions helped to ease the, the fears, um, would you say, over that um, very controversial issue of competition? Um. Um, Director of Trade, you want to answer that? Thank you very much for that question. With respect to the WTO, as Sessions Minister would have indicated in his report, um, 
it is a process that is on the government's agenda. But in light of COVID um, epidemic and other national priorities, we have outlined an agenda that looks at trying to increase uh, public awareness, particularly among companies, of the opportunities that existing trade agreements um, have. Um, the WTO is the foundation agreement for all trade agreements, so we, we believe that moving forward, we will try to create the awareness and some comfort about in the business community and um, general public about the benefits of international trade. Thank you. And I'm um, uh, Thank also you, Director. Um, one more, you have another question? Yes, I wanted to ask about the extended uh, stay program. Um, I just wondered if there were, were further details of how that would work in time. Russell? Yes. Good afternoon, Bahamas. Brilliant question, um, Madam. Uh, the extended stay program um, that the department has delivered um, is one of our goals um, for full implementation of a cash the system, but also uh, fast track um, for a launch of a high priority um, new revenue generating uh, activity recommended by the Economic Recovery Committee. The work program will allow successful applicants to study and work remotely while enjoying the pleasures of the Bahamian experience. They will work outside of the Bahamas, meaning you can remote work person and the that's if you're studying. And if you're working, um, it's $1,200 um, per person. We think that this should generate quite a bit of revenue to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and our treasury. I trust that that answers your question. Thank you, Director. Um, uh, next up is Mr. Matthew Moxie from Eyewitness News. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my first question is, what is the current backlog with regards to citizenship applications and how many, uh, how many applications have been actually granted citizenship on the government's naturalization committee? Um, director, Ms. Brandis, um, Deputy Director Brandis, uh, Brandis? <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you very much for your question. Um, I don't have exact figures for you with respect to the amount of backlog that we have, um, but we do have a citizenship commission headed by the former Justice Malcolm Adderley, as well as certain um, members of civil society, and they meet every other week to process and review these application and ensure that they are in order and then they're sent on to cabinet for final decision. So we are working through um, the numbers as they come in um, from what I've seen in the two weeks that I've held the position. Um, there seemed to be a, a steady flow of about 15 to 20 applications a week and so they're compiled and presented to the Citizenship Commission for their review and um, forwarding to the cabinet. Thank you. All right, perfect. And then my um, other question would be, what is the update on restoring the documents of those impacted by Hurricane Dorian? How far along are we in that process? Um, Director Russell, you want to take that question? Brilliant question. Uh, during the um, post-Dorian period, uh, everyone who um, would have fallen under our voice and would listen to our honorable minister in his presentations, um, he indicated very clearly, the government of the Commonwealth of Bahamas position was any individual who had lost, misplaced, or had their documents destroyed was quite privileged to come into the immigration department and seek to have those documents restored free of charge. Suffice it to say, um, to date, um, though we extended um, that privilege, we have had no one come in to suggest that their documents were lost, misplaced. Uh, I would say to you, um, ladies and gentlemen, that from my personal experience, documents of that sort um, are very cherished by persons who are of foreign ethnicity, and very rarely 
will you find that their documents are lost. And so I'm proud to say, um, having served the passport as well in immigration, that to date, though our doors have been open um, to all and sundry, we've had absolutely no reports of persons who required that free privilege, but it's been available and remains available. Thank, thank you, Doug, Director Russell. Um, next up is Jared Hicks of R News. Hello. Uh, my first question is, are immigration officers conducting enforcement exercises in communities in New Providence? That is, you know, going around and uh, checking persons' documents who they suspect uh, do not have the proper documentation. Director Russell. Uh, good question, um, sir. Uh, I think you know that the immigration department is inundated with a plethora of um, functions, um, particularly in this COVID-19 environment. I'll give you some statistics that could assist in um, your determination as to whether or not we are continuing um, to do our jobs. 218, I think you know, was um, a good year in that we did not have to deal with Dorian, nor did we have to deal with um, COVID-19. For the year 2019, we um, executed 2,290 and deported um, persons. For the year 2019, we took into custody and deported 2,664 persons. And for the record, thus far, in 2020, in spite of the circumstances in which we find ourselves as a nation and indeed a world, we have deported 829 persons to today's date. As we speak, there are some 22 persons who are in our custody on Grand Bahama. Those persons have been um, convicted. We are in the process of um, repatriating them directly from New Providence into Grand Bahama, um, back into um, their hometown of Haiti. The one Bahamian who was identified as a um, captain, uh, I'm very proud to say the courts fined him $8,000. That's $8,000 as opposed to the $300 that people were being fined and or four years in prison. And so we are very active in the community in spite of COVID-19, but not as active um, as before. I think you know that the Defense Force has tightened um, the border control. And so we've had very few, to the best of our knowledge, landings. And so we are working effectively on the other duties and responsibilities associated with the Immigration Department. Thank you, Director. Prime, Prime Minister Secretary. Yes, um, Minister, you want to chime in on that? In terms of enforcement, I think it's critical to, uh, to let the public know that one of the the role or specific purpose for our digitization process is to make the whole process of applying and enforcement much more transparent. Uh, I'm convinced that we have dead persons walking among us and that is why we are urgently addressing the scanning in of all historical files. We're cross-referencing uh, employers to see how many persons as we digitize have about six persons working as handymen on a track of land that's only 50 by 80. We're also going island by island and identifying work permits that have been granted to ensure that employers guarantee or tell us the truth in terms of where persons are living. We're finding that too many persons are being granted licenses to be in the Bahamas and they're living in shanty towns. This cannot be. And so we're tidying up on that. I'm, I want to commend the director and his men because we're focusing more on harboring. So I want to say to the Bahamians, uh, where it is you bring persons to live in the Bahamas, ensure that those persons that you will lease your apartments to are properly resident uh, in, or properly licensed by the immigration department. So I've just recently spoken to the director after we had that interception off, I think it was Freeport, to say that we need to push for one count of harboring for every person that is found in your possession. So we found, if we find 20 persons in your possession, 
I want the department to ask the court to ask them for at least $6,000 per person and enforce it. Thank you. Mr. Hicks, your second question. Okay, thank you. Um, can you, can somebody say um, what the current population is at the detention center and whether that is uh, above the center's capacity or below? Okay. That would be the director of immigration, Mr. Russell. Yes, absolutely. Very um, um, good question, sir. At present, and I'll give you the entire total and by nationality. At present, we have 65 persons at our detention center. The capacity is for 350. At present, there are 15 Haitians, one Chinese, six Cameroonians, four Nigerians, one from Sierra Leone, one from Gambia, two Indians, one American, 24 Cubans, who I might add, would be out of our country hopefully by next week, Monday, Tuesday, the latest. One from Kazakhstan, one Guyanese, one Romanian, one from Suriname, Suriname, one Swiss, one Brit, one Brazilian, and one from Turkey, also one Colombian. That is the count at this time and their nationalities. Thank you, Mr. Director, and thank you, Mr. Higgs. Um, next up is Karen Bain from Global Radio Freeport. Yes, good afternoon to everyone. Where are we as it stands with the Bahamas being compliant to being removed from the blacklist? Uh, Director Watson, you want to take that question? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your question. The Bahamas stands in a very, very good position. We have worked very long and very hard over the years to ensure that the Bahamas is seen as a country that has the highest standard of cooperation and transparency. Along with our work with industry stakeholders, regulator bodies, policymakers across the ministries, they've been doing a gargantuous job in ensuring that we meet those standards. The work of the National Risk Identification Framework Steering Committee has been absolutely outstanding. And I will say that your question was how soon and how quickly? Um, I would say within weeks, certainly before the end of the year, um, industry will see, or at least it will be revealed that the Bahamas has met the requirements necessary to be removed from the blacklist, gray list and the various international gatekeeping standards. But the work that has been put forward uh, across the financial services industry by a collaborative effort is outstanding and commendable. We continue to lean in and to push to ensure that our country is seen as one that meets the highest standard of transparency and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Watson. Um, Ms. Bain, your second question. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Watson, for your response. My second question is for the minister. What is the prognosis for Grand Bahama as the tech hub of the Bahamas? I think, I think it's very good and extremely positive. Uh, Grand Bahama has suffered the ra ravages, ravages of Hurricane Dorian. And as a country and as a people, as particular to Grand Bahama, they have demonstrated the strength, versatility to get up and go again uh, via the Industries uh, Commercial Enterprise Act and a number of legislations that we have passed. Uh, we're seeing that invest investors are still, despite COVID-19, very interested in Grand Bahama. I was delighted to announce uh, the 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 present consultant for arbitration, because that will play a key role in how we develop Grand Bahama and creating Grahama, Grand Bahama as an as a arbitration international center to invite persons to come in. And as we've been collaborating with industry uh, professionals and inviting persons uh, to come to the Bahamas, especially in terms of our value proposition, being very close to the United States of America, stable jurisdiction, stable judiciary, uh, persons are very interested. So I think, we have to work 
we have to sell ourselves as a stable, transparent jurisdiction where persons can come, live, and work. And I think people, persons don't understand the significance of where we are. We have had an uptake in economic permanent residents uh, from around the world willing to move with their families and their assets to come and live, work in the Bahamas. But we must ensure that we follow all international protocols. There is upheaval in Latin America. Uh, when you look at Hong Kong uh, and other countries in Asia, we have to be able to capitalize on those markets and those opportunities. The UK and other countries are doing just that. So through symposiums and putting persons out there, working closely with, with BFSP, we have the opportunity, and we are a leader in the financial services uh, uh, indus uh, industry, but we must understand that the playing field from your first question is not always uh, level, and onshore countries will try their best to keep resources and assets onshore, but we must create an environment where people feel comfortable, uh, where, the in, where, the, where the, judiciary, ju uh, the jurisdiction is clean for persons to continue to come. And we have demonstrated the versatility and ingenuity over the years. And so that's why we have a saying at the ministry is that uh, failure is not an option. We don't give up, we dig in. And I think this is an opportunity for innovation and to take advantage of all the opportunities that present themselves to us. So I think we are, we're in good footing to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, Ms. Bain, for those questions. Next is Mr. Rustin Jones from Eyewitness um, Digital. Good afternoon, thank you. The first question is following Hurricane Dorian, thousands of people were displaced and sought refuge in churches and shelters, both on islands impacted, but predominantly in New Providence. Um, can you say if immigration eventually went into those shelters and removed people who were not supposed to be in the Bahamas or didn't have a right to be in the Bahamas and just how many people were removed from shelters, specifically as it relates to the, um, those who were there? Director Russell? You want to speak to that? Brilliant question, sir. I think you would have heard the Honorable Minister, um, Mr. Johnson, speak publicly um, to this issue very brilliantly. Uh, at the time, post Dorian, those persons to whom you refer were regarded as custodians of the state. In no way at the time, for humanitarian purposes, did we um, go into those um, shelters and further displace um, those individuals. I think had we done so, um, we would have reaped tremendous negative um, results. And so because of the orders that were issued to us, uh, no, we absolutely did not go in and um, displace or further displace um, disenfranchised um, human beings already. What we did do, though, once the government lifted that order, uh, repatriations um, continued in the normal, humane, um, and duty-bound way. But no, the answer to your question is no. We did not go into the shelters at all um, and remove persons who were already um, displaced. Thank you, Director. Um, Minister, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I think it's critical uh, to just, and I, I want to commend the Director for a very, an excellent response. But shortly after Hurricane Dorian, the government of the Bahamas issued a, a, a pronouncement where we looked at what was happening in Abaco and in Freeport. And we said to the country and to the world that we would defend the fundamental rights of everybody. But we understood at that time, and I, and I want to commend the director and his men, that we actually had to use immigration resources to rescue persons in Abaco. And so the bus and the facilities that we had then turned into a shelter. And so that is what we were dealing with. Coming out of that, we understood that people were injured, people were traumatized. That was not the time to go into a shelter where women and children and men destitute uh, and needing help uh, that we should go in there and do uh, in force. So we said that they were of, 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 of limits for the time but we will enforce another islands that were not affected by Hurricane Dorian. Uh, we, we never went into the shelters. The shelters were closed. Uh, I know that persons, we repatriated a number of persons in accordance with the law. Uh, we're still 
safeguarding and enforcing the law, I think it's critically important that we move away from chasing paper because it slows up the process. Uh, it limits the level of transpar transparency and honesty that we want to bring to the system and really deal with the issue that we have. More importantly, we must understand that a number of those persons who might have been in shelters, some were Bahamians, but some were naturalized. And so we're still going through that process to see how best in the context of COVID-19 while saving the lives or protecting the lives of immigration officers to enforce. And we want to thank our partners, the Customs Department, the Police Department, and the Royal Bahamas Defense Force who assist valiantly in enforcing these rules. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Jones, your second question. Thank you. Thanks for answering the question. Uh, the Pan American Health Organization has expressed concern about the spread of the virus among vulnerable communities, such as migrant communities. An unregulated shanty towns, which a minister uh, mentioned earlier, presents a challenge to the effort uh, in this fight in the virus in the Bahamas. How close is the government to relocating residents in the shanty towns, uh, particularly in New Providence, Anderson, Abaco, elsewhere as well? Minister? As you very well know, uh, the issue with a number of the shanty towns are before the court and we're governed by the rule of law and so we await uh, the decision of the court. In terms of unregulate other shanty towns, you've seen what we've done. Uh, Minister Bannister was recently uh, in Abaco along in Andros along with uh, officers from the, the immigration department and I want to commend the director who first recommended a collaborative approach and we've been doing that and so we have to allow the law to follow its course in terms of those ones that were brought before the courts but we are deliberately checking we've started the process to check to see who are the persons in these communities for more than just one reason you have women and children vulnerable women and children I think we don't we don't focus on that some of whom are subject to abuse. There is the opportunity for some of these communities, like in the, in, the, in, in the general community, for nomads who may not mean this country's reputation any good to resident themselves. And we've found persons in those communities and take those communities over. And so we're working assiduously uh, to do that. Uh, we're working with our officers one of the things I, I, I want to commend the director for the secret shopper program, the mystery shopper program, and the reinstitution of the of the of the of the the complaints and corruption section, and to say to members of the public, to the extent that these communities exist, there is some acquiescence by Bahamians in so doing, because you apply for work permits. And you know that these persons and you mislead us. We're now going through our records to see who are the persons who would have provided us, possibly provided us with false information. So we'll be dealing with that. As you saw, as we've been working now from Monarch House under the citizenship, and we've brought a number of persons before the courts. I want to commend the Registrar General's Department, Ms. Sally-Ann Lockhart and the, and, the, and the manager there for assisting us to identify certain uh, uh, birth certificates that uh, belong to dead people. And so we're working, uh, and there are a number of, uh, uh, of investigations we have going, I think that will bring to light to a lot of things. I said to the director, the reason why Sir Loftus was so effective is with that he, he followed the regulations and he ensured that the rules and regulations were adhered to in a humane, and, 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 and dignified way. And that is what we have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And thank you, Mr. Jones, for those questions. Um, next is Mr. Lightburn from the Blaze, Blaze FM in Exuma. Mr. Lightburn. Good afternoon, Secretary. My first question, a novel introduction of something like the tax residency certificate has for years been speculated to be a thorn, so to speak, for offshore banks money laundering watch lists tend to hypothesize this. Do you foresee this move resulting in a, decre in a decrease in business with offshore banks here? Um, Ms. Um, Duncanson, you wanna take that question? Uh, 
Thank you again. Thank you for the question. Actually, the short answer to that is no. I don't see um, the introduction of the tax residency certificate resulting um, in, a, in a decrease simply because the ministry, along with the minister, um, you know, we're collaborating with industry stakeholders. We've been benchmarking um, the provisions of the tax residency certificate um, against international best practices and taking the best from jurisdictions around the world who have implemented the same. And so for every step of the way, we're ensuring that the provisions of the TRC is in line and of course it's beyond reproach and put us put us in a situation where um, it doesn't tarnish our reputation or result in us being um, placed on any additional um, blacklist. So as I indicated, you know, we've we've benchmarked, we are constantly collaborating and consulting with industry and ensuring that our provisions are completely in line and beyond approach. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director Duncanson. Uh, Mr. Libonia, second question. Thank you, and thank you, um, Director, for your response. Uh, my second question, my colleague Karen Bain would have made an inquiry, so just a follow-up that is perhaps suited for Ms. Watson. In reference to the Financial Action Task Force placing us on the gray list, I know that COVID-19 has delayed our on-site examination to be reassessed, and that should have taken place in April past. Do they intend to now do that virtually? And what are some of the disadvantages of remaining in that status? Director Watson. Director Watson. I am so sorry, apologies. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I indicated that yes, the COVID-19 certainly has impacted the on-site inspection of the Financial Action Task Force. With that being considered, we remained on the list. However, the National Risk Identification Framework Steering Committee is doing an outstanding job of ensuring that those inspections take place and they will happen in short order. We expect the committee to um, have a briefing once this is done before the end of the year. Um, I don't want to preempt the report of that committee, so I will say that in the short term, we do expect that those inspections will take place. Thank you. Thank you, Director Watson. And thank you, Mr. Lightwing, for your questions. Next is Ms. Tyler Simonet from JCN. Yes, good afternoon. Um, my first question is, is, is the Department of Immigration still not accepting any new work permits? And if not, any idea as to when that will start to happen again? Are you waiting possibly for the the pandemic to maybe slow down or any idea as to when that'll start up again? Um, Director Russell. Yes, ma'am. Um, good question. Uh, the Department of Immigration never ceased um, accepting um, work permit applications. Uh, during the initial course of the pandemic, uh, we went virtual. Uh, we issued to the nation um, our website, um, the relevant phone numbers, um, our Facebook page, so that persons who would have wished to renew work permits, um, obviously many expired during the course of the pandemic, we gave our website at the time, and I'll, I'll refer to that, so that persons could have applied for not just work permits, but also extensions. I think you must be mindful that the docks for immigration never shut down. Um, the Detention center never shut down. The airport throughout the entire um, pandemic, and like my minister said, we'd like to specifically thank um, all of those officers on the front line who, during the entire um, course of this pandemic, have never left duty. And so the answer to your question is we never really shut down. What we did do was moved to the online um, procedures 
um, for applying for your renewals and or new work permits. And we gave a call line, which was interactive so that you could speak with us uh, so that we can extend your extensions, et cetera, while continuing to remain during the lockdowns in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas until the borders of the applicable countries um, were open. And so the long and short is no, we never really stopped. What we've done is because of certain restrictions in our country, we have fine tuned and are watching a little more carefully, but we never really shut down um, um, granting and work permits. Thanks, Director. Minister, you want to add to that? Yes, and I, I want to commend the Director again. I think in, in one of the strategies for enforcement, when that the issue of the non-granting of, 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 of work permits first ar arose in the community, was when we made a statement that first time applications may not be approved and that the, the policy was always that persons who want to work in the Bahamas should make those applications from their country of residence, but that we do reserve the discretion to entertain them because what we found is that a number of persons were coming to the Bahamas and the director can confirm on vacations and suddenly turning up on, 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 on on work at workplaces and working. And so we were saying that if you, in the main, if you make a work permit application, you're required to be home. And we've been saying to persons when they make the applications, we're being refused and they say, go home, make that application because it then becomes a difficulty to find the individual if they're here and then to repatriate them if we find them. And it's, it, and it's a serious cost. The other thing that the director and I have discussed is that when we find persons, especially well, we, want to, we don't want to designate, but those persons who we found the other day heading for America should be fine that they have employees in the Bahamas. We're going to now require the cost of housing those persons from those individuals. And so for where we had to store them in the hotel, if that ho the going rate for a hotel room to keep that person is $300 a night, you will pay the government of the Bahamas $300 a night and the airfare to take that person back. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Ms. Simonich, your second question. Yes, thanks so much for that response. Um, my second question is for Minister Johnson. Uh, last month you mentioned that there is a, you consider that there's a skill gap in the Bahamas and that you were in discussions with the Department of Labor to remedy that situation. Can we get an update on that? Any future plans to tackle the skill gap problem? Minister? I think when I made that statement, we had a symposium in Abaco, uh, and that and that symposium uh, on the availability of labor in Abaco was attended by the the Chamber of Commerce, local chamber, resident chamber of commerce in Abaco, the president for the construction association, if I'm calling it right. You had the director of labor uh, being a part of that, and we had representatives from the from from industry there. And one of the things that they discovered uh, and they complained about was that they needed more persons with the skill sets to do the work uh, that is required. I think the technical school and a number of other persons separate and apart from myself has identified the need for training and to provide such training. And so in terms of what we were hearing on the ground, that persons were saying, not everybody with a hammer in their hand is a contractor. And so that is one of the reasons why, we, one, we've been enforcing during the COVID-19 and working closely with labor to ensure that you, you do have the skill sets. But um, uh, recently during a, a, a rotary presentation, you know, you need, you may be a carpenter, you may be a welder, but there are different grades of carpenters or welders, but where we find that we do have the skill set, then we, 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 we're ensuring that we utilize them, but where there is not the skill set, we need the training. And I think what I spoke to is internationally accepted. Uh, even in terms of digitization, uh, we found that we, have, we now have to do training in the ministry, we're encouraging, uh, persons nationally to upgrade themselves so that we can take advantage of the new opportunity because COVID-19 overnight, I'm at my house, the director, I think is at the, the, the at, at immigration 
and we are at different locations and we haven't lost a step in terms of how we work. Every day I'm in quarantine, I'm in excellent health uh, and doing our work. So life requires a constant learning curve. And I think we, with the level of investment that is gonna come to the Bahamas, we have to continue to upgrade ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Ms. Simonet, for your question. Next is Mr. Rashad Rowe from the Tribune. Rashad, your first question. Good day, thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, earlier this week, when your colleague Desmond Bannister was talking to the press about the North Andrew Shantytown, he indicated that one of the loopholes with the work permit process has traditionally been that the government isn't too concerned with requiring that people who apply for work permits for other people ensure that those people have a suitable place to live. And, and he suggested that there was a need to make various changes to fix that problem. So I wanted to know if you had any insight into what the government might do to address this. Could we be seeing any legislative fixes? In terms, I don't know, I don't know that you may be correct in what Mr. Bannister said in terms of persons having a, a proper and suitable place to reside. Because I know that he and I, we have been working closely on this matter. Uh, we've produced a report uh, from officers on the ground and the other team members of persons who reside there. And uh, we are going to be reaching out to the employers. Uh, uh, to see, to inquire of persons uh, who may be living there and to straighten out where persons live. Uh, I think, you know, it's critical that we underscore that the law requires that when persons come to the country that we don't allow them to come legitimately or license them to come in a way that they then become a burden on the public purse. And so if Ellsworth Johnson wants to go to con come to the Bahamas to work, we, we try our best through labor laws and rules to ensure that they're paid at least minimum wage and that we ensure that the person has somewhere to lay their head uh you know and 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 and, and goes beyond just the economic migrant that's to ensure that you're not taken advantage of and you're not found to be in a position where you're being trafficked so there's so many other things we were looking at but i know from my interaction with the honorable minister both of us are seriously concerned in terms of persons being resident in these communities, the conditions under which they live, because we don't want our families to live like that. And insofar as they are part of the human family, it creates a serious difficulty for us. And so we're working, as I said earlier in the presentation, uh, to see how we can work that out. Some employers may be able to relocate uh, for those who cannot find proper residence. Well, some people, some of those persons are Bahamians, might have already been naturalized. So we're going to see how we work that out and situate those persons who are Bahamians. That may be a plan. But for those persons who come to the Bahamas to live and work, we would always want to say to the, not just to the local or international community, that we're ensuring that the law as it stands, which is designed to protect the fundamental dignity of the human person and ensure that they're not placed in an outhouse, that they're protected. But I know that from my discussions with the Honorable Minister, we are at Edom, I mean, on the same level with, with in terms of how we secure persons who live in those communities and how we go about educating them. And I want to commend the director and his team, even in this COVID-19 crisis, for the information or clips that they've been producing in Creole, Mandarin, and Spanish, advising persons to take care of themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Roll, your second question? Yes. Um, again, Mr. Johnson, the, the Prime Minister in 2017 talked about wanting to make changes to the Bahamas Nationality Act in order to equalize access to citizenship for children who, who have at least a, a Bahamian parent. Are, are you able to say definitively whether we will see such legislation passed this term? I, I cannot speak to whether or not the legislation will pass during this time. We had Hurricane Dorian, we had COVID-19 uh, that has required uh, 
a lot of attention to be taken elsewhere. It is a priority document. I can tell you, I want to commend civil society, uh, and in, uh, Dame Anita Allen for the uh, assiduous work that she has done uh, to prepare it. And we're still having recommendations sent in. Uh, it's very serious. And so I'm hoping that uh, if not before, we can properly address it. But I want to commend the Monarch House and the commission that is being put together that is seriously addressing the whole issue of persons who have been here. And I think the process is significantly sped up while we try our best to properly uh, vet those individuals who are coming forward. And that's why the, I want to say this, that's why the director is so keen on digitization because you can imagine a process when your name go into the system, Interpol, uh, FIU and all of the other agencies can check your name, we can check with the department so we can see as we've been doing in the past, persons who come with other persons identification, we are realizing and, and every, oh, let me say this to you. We have an obligation to move in a, in a fair and reasonable time and, and, and be justified in our, in our processes. But a lot of these applications that, are, that some of them that come in, uh, we're finding that persons who have NIB numbers weren't issued by NIB. Uh, and a number of things we're finding, and we're going to prosecute these people. But with the with with and and with the with with, with the advert of, of digitization, and there's a that's a benefit of COVID nineteen. We're going to be able to move much quickly to deal with these matters. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Rowe, for your questions. Next is Jasper Ward from the Nassau Guardian. Your first question. Uh, good evening. Uh, can you say how many immigration officers have tested positive for COVID-19 since March? Director. Uh, well, that is a good question. Well, that is um, a particular medical um, question um, designed for the medical team. Um, suffice it to say, I can say that we have had in excess of 70 persons who have been quarantined thus far, in spite of the fact that we are regarded as an essential service and are out there in the front line. Now, with regard to how many um, have tested positive, um, as I indicated, that is a medical question, but we have had a significant amount of persons who have um, tested positive, and thank God um, we have not lost any individuals. Um, thank God again. Um, all of our persons thus far have um, recovered and recovered fully. Uh, there are still 11 persons who are currently um, quarantined. Uh, those are not work related, but I think you do know that we are a part of the society. We are your husbands, your brothers, your sisters and the rest of it. And so from time to time, you will find that we are as well afflicted by the issues of the world. Uh, but your question is really a medical one. Um, I will speak specifically to the facts, but as to whom um, a COVID um, I'm positive, uh, I'm not prepared to respond to that just now. Thank you, Director. Um, Ms. Ward, your second question. Can you say whether there have been any COVID cases at the detention center? A very good question. Uh, let me first um, um, preempt that with our policy. Whenever persons are taken into custody in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas or outside who are returned to this nation, uh, there is a written policy um, produced by the Director of Immigration that has been published. Anyone who was taken into custody prior um, to coming into immigration custody must be visited by the government's COVID-19 um, health team. Once they are cleared, uh, they are then accepted into our detention center. I think you do know that we have a medical doctor on board at the immigration department, the person of Dr. Francois. Uh, he and his medical team do a secondary check once they were to enter the gates of the detention center. Such persons are then placed in what we regard as a holding area, not the common population, but a holding area area for a period of 14 days. Once that 14 day period were to expire, they are again visited by a group of medical professionals who then deem that those persons are not symptomatic 
And at that time, and only at that time, uh, are they entered into the general population if necessary. And so the procedure um, has proven so far, uh, we may knock on wood, absolutely foolproof. Thank you, Director, and thank you, Ms. Ward, for your questions. Next is Ms. Christina, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this last name, from R News Online. Yes, Christina Dragovich. <laughs> This is a follow-up to Jasper's question. Um, what are the safety protocols like for the immigration officers to remain safe in this period of COVID-19? Director. Uh, brilliant question. Uh, Madam, I think you would have heard our honorable minister speak to the issue of the immigration department was one of the very first government agencies to implement our temperature um, um, thermometers at most of our um, sites. In addition to that, we were the first to come with our standalone um, security measures. Uh, we also placed shields, um, PPEs, and all of the others available to our immigration officers. Every individual um, since the um, commencement of this serious and deadly pandemic, we had two sessions, one in Grand Bahama, headed by the medical um, expert, Dr. Bartlett, who lectured with all of our officers on all of the policies and procedures regard to safeguarding themselves and their respective families. That went on very, very well. We also had the same thing done in New Providence, headed by um, um, Dr. Brennan, who is the expert in New Providence. In addition to that, we hired once our officers were on the front line and in fact were on quarantine and affected, psychologist, clinical psychologist, Dr. Gregory Swan, who has, is on retainer by the department and has provided psychological um, support for all of our officers in addition to their families whenever they have been um, affected. And so I'm very proud to say that from where I sit, every single officer is very much aware of the do's and the don'ts. I think our honorable minister also alluded to the fact that we have a video that has gone out not only to our population within the department, but also to the general public in Creole, in English, in Spanish, and in Mandarin, identifying proper wearing of your masks, proper sanitary measures, etc. And so we are satisfied that everything that we could possibly humanely do thus far for our officers to remain safe has been done within reason. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Director. Ms. Christina, your second question. Thank you. Um, today we learned that the extended stay visa program is going to be rolled out pretty soon next week. What are some of the requirements for students and for workers who wish to apply for this? Uh, Ms. Thank you for your question. Um, we have sought to streamline the requirements for students um, seeking to study from within the Bahamas. And so the main requirement is, of course, that they can prove that they are currently enrolled in a recognized um, university as well as that they have the financial support um, to carry them through the 12 month period. So basically once they submit um, the usual due diligence documents, a police certificate, a medical certificate, they declare that they can financially support themselves while they're here in the Bahamas and that they are enrolled in an accredited university and they pay of course the requisite fee. That's basically, um, the main the main requirements thank you thank you deputy director duncanson and that brings us to the end of our report i want to thank our industry um media partners um for their questions and thank you bahamas have a safe evening thank you <laughs>